Um, all right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Andrea Chin. I'm a judge here in Seattle Municipal Court. And I'm here today in my role as the probation liaison judge. And I'm also part of the probation evolution project steering committee. My co-presenters today are our three probation department managers, and they are Carol Bell, Tanya Dotson, and Jason Grant. This is our, our second webinar this year. And if you attended the webinar in June, uh, you heard an overview of our probation evolution project. And during this session, we are going to cover a little bit of that information from the uh, first um, webinar. And then we'll go back and get into the details of some new probation policies that are going into effect in October. Uh, and then we'll save the last half hour for audience questions. The probation evolution team uh, has based its work on what we've learned from multiple assessments and evaluations, as well as feedback and stakeholders from probation clients. And I am very excited to be part of this project that will update and transform the way probation works here in our court. So what is probation uh, in Seattle Municipal Court? So for um, uh, non-lawyers in the um, audience, Probation is a post-adjudication case management program. And what this means is that probation may become involved after a defendant pleads guilty, is found guilty at trial, or resolves his or her case with something like an agreed continuance with conditions attached. When a case is resolved, um, the court may order several conditions that will require some action and engagement on the part of the defendant. Sometimes the conditions are uh, negotiated and agreed upon by the parties, and sometimes the court will impose them on its own. Many cases in Seattle Municipal Court are never referred to probation. Uh, however, after reviewing, reviewing the facts and circumstances of any particular case, the court may determine that certain conditions of sentence or resolution would be appropriate. And some common examples are uh, chemical dependency treatment or mental health treatment. And in those cases, the court may refer that particular defendant to probation to monitor those conditions. Probation staff rarely, if ever, weigh in on what conditions are appropriate on any case. Instead, the probation counselor's role is to support their clients to successfully complete the court ordered conditions. They help their clients achieve self-identified goals with the ultimate objective of transitioning them out of the criminal legal system. Well, why probation evolution? In 2020, we began redesigning our approach to probation as a result of stakeholder and community feedback. And we had our own desire to eliminate disproportionate impacts on the people that we serve. Over the past several months, we've hired a project manager and we've had a team of staff all working together, ensuring there is a clear unified vision for the project and that it's backed by a commitment, a sheer commitment of our judges. Our team has developed the following goal statement for this project. Transform our probation, our programs and services division by stepping away from traditional incarcerative reactionary approaches to misdemeanor supervision toward one that is hopeful, equitable, and supportive of the client's success and growth. We've learned a lot so far as we've dived into probation evolution. Some of the things that we've done is we've had some different activities to engage you in the community. We want to continue learning as we bring this work to fruition. We want to do continuous improvement, looking at how we're engaging our clients so that our clients get the best possible outcome from the work that we're providing. Now, here's a little bit about our project plan. You'll see that in July, we developed our new classification system. This allowed us to gather feedback on the proposed system this summer. 
we held some focus groups in that. And to see how the system performs with a so small set subset of clients, we have what we've identified as our scrum team to do, um, to start out on the first leg of this work in engaging the clients that were referred to probation over the summer months. Now, we're looking at this to see what changes may be, need to be made before we debut the system to the rest of the department October 1st. Along with the evaluating the new classification system, the project team has also started to look at how we will evolve and work with clients that are facing issues of non-compliance. We've been working hard to develop policy and that will debut in October as well. You can expect to hear more from us in the weeks and months to come. So stay tuned. Tanya, you're muted. One of the important milestones that happened this year, which has set the stage for a lot of the work we're doing now was the decision to eliminate our use of a risk assessment tool to determine reporting frequency. That decision was made March of 2022. Uh, the tool attempted to score public safety risk and the score determined how often a client needed to report to probation. Risk assessment tools, um, our previous tool was the Wisconsin, intend to avoid risk of human bias, but they rely on factors like arrest history, peer associations and employment status. And the Wisconsin was found to be failing to differentiate between risk levels. It was over classifying risk with especially adverse effects for black and Native American clients. Courts are required to use a standard, standardized classification system to determine how often probation clients report when we retired the risk assessment tool, we were left with the challenge of what will our new classification system be? In the next few slides, we're gonna cover the new classification system as well as a few other new policies that are gonna go live in October. And those are the new reporting guidelines, case plans, and quarterly progress reports. Our old system that we used to determine reporting frequency was based on that risk assessment tool. Once a person was assigned to the probation, the risk tool would be scored and they were given a classification level. Clients at the highest risk level, level one, need to report to probation one time a month. The risk assessment scored most clients as level one, meaning that most clients were required to come in in person once a month. And there wasn't really a clear path for people to start reporting to probation less often. SMC has now developed a new classification system as required by the state court rule. The new classification system is broken up into three phases. Phase one, all, all clients will be, re be starting on phase one, regardless of offense, will report in person one time a month for the first 90 days. After that 90 days or three months, reporting frequency will be driven by the client's performance. If the client is successful staying compliant with their court-ordered conditions, they'll then move to phase two. When a client successfully moved to phase two, they'll report virtually or by phone if virtual meeting is not possible once a month. After 90 days on phase two, the client may move to phase three if they're successfully complying with conditions. Phase three is if a client remains in compliance with their conditions and identified benchmarks for reduction are met, the client moves into phase three, which has no reporting requirement for the remainder of probation. The client still needs to keep up with their court ordered conditions, but they no longer need to report to their counselor. If a client falls out of compliance with their conditions during phase two or three, they return to phase one and their counselor will submit progress reports every 30 days until they are eligible for reduction.
Hi guys, my name is Jason Grant. I'm one of the other probation managers uh, at Seattle Municipal Court. I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about a couple of the um, areas with respect to work product, um, sort of added tools that the probation counselors will start and will begin to, will begin to use um, as these policies get rolled out next month. Uh, they're the case, what we call the case plan uh, and the progress report. The first one I wanna to talk to you a little bit about is the case plan. In our old method or approach of, of doing um, work around um, items independent of uh, what a client was compelled to do um, at the direction of the court um, was uh, in essence going through the process where you know the judge would assign conditions at sentencing. You know, those standard conditions would be no criminal law violations, reporting to probation, going through any therapeutic um, uh, programming that was required. Uh, you know, that, that process largely stays the same. As a part of that process, traditionally or for, you know, decades, we've had the client sign a probation agreement. And I don't know if anyone on the call today has seen our probation agreement. It's, it's a pretty sterile, um, really basic uh, document that outlines pretty much everything that the court imposes um, as a part of the judgment and sentence. So you would see everything from, you know, the probation obligation itself to say a treatment requirement, um, all the way down to things like, you know, um, any jail that was suspended or uh, fines or fees that were imposed, even though the court's divested from imposing those. Um, the client. Uh, what, or what often, the counselor would often work with the client sort of, you know, as they got to know them to sort of identify kind of what else was going on in that client's life, uh, you know, what their particular needs were and, and work at sort of a voluntary basis to, to meet those needs. That process wasn't necessarily defined in our policy. It was just good casework. Uh, and what we wanted to do is try to bring that approach um, and establish it as the floor of our practice and a baseline for for good work is how do we how do we work with clients not only on the things that the courts ask them to do, but the area other areas of their life that are important to them or the you know, needs that are identified that are going to help them accomplish you know unique specific goals that are important to them. So in future current or in future state, you know, the, the process of a court referring a client to us is largely going to stay the same. <clears throat> What's going to be different is instead of doing a probation agreement, that old archaic sterile document, we're going to produce and provide to the client a case plan. And that case plan is going to be very specific in what it outlines not only what the client's expected to accomplish based on what the court's ordered, but also what kind of things that we can engage the client on, on a voluntary non-compulsory level that are gonna just help a client improve their life and meet you know, personal needs and goals. So the case plan really includes co those court obligations. Um, and, and when we say that, we're gonna limit those obligations to the things that the client needs to accomplish to get off of supervision. So it's really gonna be focused on re the requirement that they report at the cadence that their phase requires, that they follow through with the therapeutic or programming requirements that the courts imposed, if any, and that the client avoid new criminal law violations. Some clients, if imposed, might have a drug testing obligation. If the court orders it, that would be included and the client will see that in the case plan. And there, um, some clients, if there's an abstinence condition, will see that, that that expectation on the case plan as well. That represents one half of the left side of the case plan. And the other side is where the counselor really dives into what's going on with their client and what we think of their you know, personal needs and goals. And throughout that intake process, that first 30 days of really developing that relationship and getting to know the client, then the counselor populates that side of the case plan with whatever areas the client really wants help or assistance or wants to focus on. So if you can imagine, you know, a lot of the things that our clients go through, everything from, you know, um, gaining employment or getting their driver's license um, to figuring out, you know, how to get public benefits, 
Uh, it could be something as personal as, you know, wanting assistance in, um, you know, navigating, um, you know, how to stay in compliance with another court or, um, you know, it's, it's really unique to what the client would like assistance in. That case plan will be provided to the client. And then the probation counselor will be expected at every interaction throughout the life of the case to address those things and those needs and goals that were identified in that case plan and document those efforts. I just want, I want to preface that this is good practice. This is a practice that's largely been done by our department for, gener for decades. It's just never been established as an expectation. And so we're moving in that direction. So, you know, we, when we pull up a, let's say a client's case, we can see all those efforts that the counselor's taking to really help that client in those areas that are outside of what the court's asked them to do. The other area is progress reports. We can go to the next slide, sorry. Um, so I guess the thing I want the group or the, the folks that are participating today to understand is a progress report is the probation is going to be the probation counselor's mechanism to to show how a classification decision is made. Every time a decision is made on how often and in what method a client reports, it will be uh, accompanied by a progress report that details why that decision was made. So anytime a client's classification or their reporting frequency is reduced or increased or maintained based on the guidelines that we establish, the probation counselor will write a very brief summary of why that decision was made. It will highlight things like, is the client's reporting reliability um, satisfactory? Are they following through with the steps necessary to engage in treatment? Or if they're in treatment, are they maintaining compliance? Are they avoiding new criminal law violations? Those areas will be outlined in the progress report. Um, in addition to that, then the counselor will also identify if it's appropriate, you know, what we're, what the counselor doing to support the client, uh, uh, identify any barriers that the client might be experiencing to in accomplishing those areas that are outlined in the progress report, but also those other things in the case plan where we're engaging the client on a voluntary basis. Um, so that, you know, we show, you know, not only, uh, you know, how that client's doing on the compulsory areas, but also how they're doing with, you know, the other areas of their life that we're trying to support them in. The important thing too to know about progress reports is that those reports will be not only in the probation file, but they'll be in the court file as well. So once the counselor completes that report, it will be submitted into to ECF, into our court uh, file system. So those parties, if a client um, were to come back before the court for whatever reason, there's a story to be told about how that client got through up to that point, how they were doing and how they progressed through um, their experience with probation. I think I'm done, guys. Carol, you're up. Sorry, my speaker wasn't on. Well, now my most favorite part of what we're doing is our community engagement. In June, we asked for feedback from our former clients and our local service providers about the new reporting guidelines. We held an exciting focus group and we got some really good information from them. The question that we put out is, what is equitable and fair in the plan? The feedback we heard was everyone starts at the same place. Clients progress quicker based on performance and they believe that it improves equity by focusing on goals and barriers. One client even said, we wish this was in place when I was on probation. Now, there's also the question of what could be better? The feedback that we heard was for us to better support clients that are illiterate. They may have a native language they speak, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they read it. 
They also said, make sure practices are consistent across all staff. Stop moving people to different probation counselors while they're on probation. Address risks that probation counselors may have bias. And then there was the idea that they really appreciated the opportunity to give feedback at the sessions, but they wanted opportunities to hear more or to be able to give more information to us. So what we're doing is we're looking at how we can address some of the recommendations that we heard from them. And we're also giving other avenues to solicit feedback from them. Some of you may have heard about the exit survey that allows for them to solicit be well allows us to solicit feedback, but we're also looking at other ways to hear from them throughout their time while they're on probation, not just at the end. And I guess really now it's just about hearing from you. What questions based on what we shared with you all today have come to mind? There may be questions that came from our June webinar that remain unanswered from you or that have come up along the way. So we're here. I can share with you some of the questions that we got from the June webinar that we did answer. In the meantime, we encourage you all to pop any of your questions in the chat. One of the questions we heard in June were, if active probation is closed, but there is still jurisdiction, how is the court notified of a new criminal law violation? For example, if there was a domestic violence case that remains open, with the condition of a no contact order. Is the no contact order violation condition dropped when probation closes? No, the, that order remains active until the actual court closes the case. Probation is just a department that monitors the obligations that are put out by the court. We do not determine when a no contact order ends. That is something that actually happens in the courtroom and the victim, victim in the case is made well aware of ahead of time. Another question we have is what kind of incentives are going to be offered and is it possible to get examples of this incentives that will be used? We think that our Biggest incentive to the clients is ending probation as early as possible. We're looking at other opportunities to incentivize their engagement with us, but we feel like that is the biggest incentive. Listening to our clients and what they're asking for from us, limiting their contact along the way as they're progressing through probation so they don't have to come downtown, they don't have to take time off of work, things like that are really important to us in responding to the client's needs and we feel like those are incentives as well. Carol, it looks like we have a question in the chat. What if a client is progressing well but wishes to continue seeing his counselor for additional support accountability. Um, I, can, I can respond to that. I, uh, we can, a client can choose to report more often or report, continue reporting to their probation counselor. We just will not be compelling them to do so. And they won't be held accountable for missing an extra appointment in the month. So that's absolutely <coughs> appropriate thing to happen, Omar. Thanks for the question. Then I see we have another question from John McGoodwin. Please go over phase three in the new classification system coming in October. Jason, do you want to take that on? Yeah, I'd be happy to. You know, phase three is basically, uh, you know, the client's been on, on probation for a minimum of six months. They progressed from phase one into phase two, which means they, after 90 days, they showed follow through with um, you know, what the court and what their probation counselors asked them to do with respect to reporting and following through with programming. 
uh, at the six month mark, the 180 day mark, if they're continuing to show compliance, they're showing up on their virtual or phone appointments. There's no uh, you know, community safety concerns identified or, or um, non-compliance. Then they'll, they'll be removed from the requirement to report at all. And the counselor will continue to work with them. They'll continue to monitor their follow through with treatment. Uh, their uh, their compliance with you know the avoidance of new criminal law violations, but there's no expectation that they have any communication with the counselor unless the client needs it or something else comes up and necess necessitates a phone call. The other thing I think it's really important to uh, to to point out in the phase three client is the probation counselor won't be in a position to compel them to report in person uh, without manager's approval. So if there is something that comes up and the counselor wants to see that client and compel an appointment, there's gonna be a process where that case, there needs to be some shared decision-making on requiring that client who has shown extensive follow-through and compliance to get to that, to, to that level, um, you know, why we're asking them to come in and, and report in person on a, uh, on a required basis. Okay, we have another question in the chat from Jennifer Bell. Is there a preferred avenue for service <laughs> providers to team up with counselors to help develop this new and improved case plan? Jason or Tanya, do either of you want to take this one on? I think, I think that's a great question. I think anytime there's an opportunity to partner up with a treatment provider, we need to take advantage of it. You know, I think those that are in this industry understand that, you know, some treatment providers are really responsive. Um, to collaboration and others not so much. Uh, I think one of the one of the areas of practice that we're working on now is identifying what you know interventions would look like when a client's at risk of returning to court. Uh, you know, at this point, we're calling them you know the potentially something like case plan intervention. You know, the client's starting to fall out of compliance. They're starting to um, incur technical violations. You know, what can we do to sort of identify those early and collaborate so we can avoid um, review hearings, uh, returning that client back to court? And one of those things that's in those C that CPI idea is, you know, really calling out the need to collaborate with the treatment provider so that we have a plan that we're both on top with and even going so far as to coordinate like three-way calls between the client and the treatment provider to figure out what the client needs and how to best support them, identify the barriers that they have, you know, what's going on, why are they struggling with following through, uh, you know, with respect to the case plan, you know, a lot of our clients aren't engaged in services for the first 30 days. And that's kind of when we're identifying sort of how to populate that case plan and really focus on, uh, you know, what that client wants to work on. But I think it'd be, you know, a really interesting thing to explore is, you know, how we could work and collaborate with the provider after the intake to see if there's anything additionally that that we could, you know, we could add or include, uh, you know, to really call out kind of how to support the client. So we'd be really interested in that. Okay, looks like Jennifer is also provided in the chat her contact <laughs> information, so she is ready to hear from our probation counselors. That's great. So we have um, Damon Agnes, and Damon says, if I remember correctly, probation would previously recommend that probation be terminated in some cases because they deemed the client not slash no longer a good candidate for probation. Would that still occur in the new system? And in the new system, will probation no longer recommend or seek sanctions beyond return to the previous phase. I, I'd like to tackle that too, if I may, Carol. I see, I saw that <laughs> smile, go ahead. And I, I think that's a great question and I'm glad you asked it, Damon, and it doesn't surprise me that you did. Um, so we're actually in the process right now, what you're talking about is, is non-compliance response and violation response. And we have a policy that's 22 years old that sort of guides how we respond to non-compliance. And we are knee deep in the middle right now of rewriting that policy. One of the things that we've already committed to in our violation response is really differentiating between how we respond to technical noncompliance and how we respond to substantive uh, noncompliance. The first step of that was to differentiate between the two and define them. Uh, and then 
craft a process for how to work through a client in technical violation in hopes of avoiding um, you know, court intervention or having to put a client before a judge. But we also recognize that there are times when court intervention is necessary uh, and then sometimes required, depending on the violation. But what we're also exploring too is, is divesting from a role where a sanction is recommended as a, as a response to noncompliance and moving more towards should the client continue with probation and what, what does that look like? Or should the client is the client to, to your point, no longer a candidate. Why? What efforts did we put in place um, to assist the client in avoiding this, the, the place that, that, uh, um, that the client's in, where that decision is even having to be made? Uh, I think the reality is that there will be scenarios where, you know, after a certain period of time, it's, it's clear that a client's follow through is not likely. Um, and the efforts that we've put in place uh, are not proving to be effective, but we're not going to put our counselors in a position where they're going to be recommending specific sanctions. We feel that that's the role of the parties and the court, and we'll, def we'll, we'll be deferring that specific conversation um, to them. But we will be weighing in on uh, you know, our, uh, our thoughts on whether the client's you know, a continued good candidate will also always include in our reports, whether we feel there are community safety concerns that the court needs to be aware of. So that will continue to be a part of our work. Okay, thank you, Jason. Um, and there was a question in the chat about will we be sending this out and this webinar will be available to review for those that are unable to see its entirety today. John McGoogland has another question, and I think this really is for you and I, Tanya. It says, regarding specialty courts, mental health court, veterans treatment court, are there any changes to expect? What about for your mental health court, Tanya? Well, mental health court and veterans treatment courts, both, um, there's a lot of interaction between the parties in crafting the orders. So obviously, we would continue to follow those orders and those clients would continue to appear in court as necessary. They would also be um, given the benefit of the case plans and all the other, other things that we're gonna be offering. We'll be doing progress reports, all other things. So there won't be a lot of difference. Um, hope that answers your question, John. What about community court, maybe Carol? Yeah, so for community court, at this point, we will continue status quo with the current operating procedures. As always, we continue to evaluate that program, and it has been evolving since it reemerged um, a little bit over a year ago. In terms of our pretrial services menu, those programs will continue to carry on as they have in the pretrial world and we continue to develop those out as well let's see we have a question from dominique hardeman is seattle municipal court developing their own case plans or will the department utilize a case plan developed by a private vendor what training will the team go through for case planning Jason, do you want to take no, this one? Yeah, I, I can tackle that. Um, thanks for the question, uh, Dom. Uh, we've developed our own case plan, and it's it's a probation agreement case um, case plan hybrid. So, like I said, it kind of outlines the, the compulsory conditions that the judge has imposed, um, but then also outlines you know areas unique to the client that the client wants to focus on. You know, the 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 crux of what's expected of a client on misdemeanor probation is largely focused on the areas that the court has imposed. Our counselors don't and will not have the ability to add conditions um, to, you know, to their probation or their supervision. Uh, they don't have the authority to do that. So what you know, our counselors will be doing is continuing to work with the client to, to 
um, not only during the intake phase, but throughout the life of the case, you know, identify the areas where, you know, you could maybe call them criminogenic needs, um, but we didn't want to limit it to what's, you know, typically considered criminogenic. Anything that's going on in that client's life that would benefit and, and, and help them come out the backside of probation in a better place than when they started. With respect to training around case planning, you know, I would say not specifically, but our department has spent a lot of time in the last year training on harm reduction, trauma-informed care, and motivational interviewing. And those will be annual uh, and reoccurring trainings um, that we've committed to. Uh, and so, you know, we hope that as we, as our counselors kind of continue to enhance, what we already feel is, you know, uh, a pretty impressive uh, competency level around engaging clients that, you know, continuing to focus on these areas of training, you know, we'll, we'll put them better poised to identify, you know, areas of need and support that, that will populate that case plan. Thank you, Jason. Our next question, housing is a need for many SMC clients. I understand that that is largely out of SMC control, but will the new model offer anything as far as connecting people to housing? So the new model is not designed really to connect people to the specific housing resource. What we do have here um, is the Courts Community Resource Center that's located on the second floor. And we continue to use that as a heavy resource for our clients. We directly refer them to the resource center to be engaged with all available social service connections. One of those social service connections or providers in there, we've had the benefit of a um, caseworker that's on contract from the Y. And what they're doing is helping to look at a client's needs and refer them out to any housing resources we may be connected with. We do have a resource called the Housing Connector that we've recently partnered with to help those that have specific barriers with getting into um, housing, get some long-term case management support. The Resource Center continues to provide a variety of other services, such as connecting people with cell phones, DSHS support. We provide um, hygiene kits and other tangible resources like food resources as well. We encourage clients to continue to come in for that support well after their time off probation, as well as anyone else from the community. Well, right now, I don't see any other questions in the chat. Wait, here comes one from Julie Huffman. Sometimes victims have ideas of what they would like to see the defendant do as a reparation or things they would have or things that they think would help the person, particularly if the victim is a family member or intimate partner, could they suggest items to be added to the person's goals? Tanya? Yeah, of course, victims could make suggestions to, uh, to the counselor and help with the intimate partner's goals. And as part of DVIP, as you know, Julie, um, those things can be brought in during our multidisciplinary team. Um, as far as our probation counselors contact with victims, they don't necessarily have a lot. So if you had avenues that you would like to offer those suggestions, we would absolutely be open to taking those in and working with the clients. So maybe a direct email to the probation counselor around what those things might be. Okay, are there any more questions out there? I 
not seeing anything. So it looks like we're just getting a lot of appreciation. Thank yous for our responses. And the, there's appreciation for the transparency that uh, the department is showing in the work that we're doing. Well, what I would like to do is thank each of you for coming to our webinar. Oh, hold on. There's another question. Here's one from Kimberly Brown. If probation counselors are out of the office, will there be someone in place to do their client care? Jason? There will always be someone in the office to support a client if they come in and their assigned counselor is not available to them. Um, we're in the office uh, five days a week. We're not, our counselors aren't in the office five days a week, but we're staffed five days a week. So we're rotational right now. And just for those that are involved with our clients now, um, you should know that probation counselors will start being inside SMC um, two days a week. And that could be reevaluated once we roll out policies in October. There will always be someone there ready to support a client if they come in and they need support. There will also always be someone available to take a call if they call into the office and their counselor is not available as well. Although I will say that, you know, we will do everything we can to first see if we can't connect their client to their assigned counselor, because we recognize that that's the person that knows them the best. And one of the other things too, and I think Carol alluded it to her earlier, is, you know, in our earlier engagement sessions with former clients, it was hands down the thing that they felt impacted them the, the most was the the struggle that ensued when count when they transitioned from one probation counselor to another, uh, they really valued you know those initial months of uh, their uh, their interaction with their probation counselor and the development of that relationship. Those counselors that get to know them through the intake process know them best. They ask all the right questions, and the reality is that there is a departure from that as as a client moves from one counselor to another. And so we're working really hard to develop policies to minimize when a case is transferred and then support that client in a better way when we, there's, there's, no, um, there's no way to avoid a transfer. Um, so we certainly recognize the importance of that relationship and want to support it in every way we can. Thank you, Jason. Um, before I let anyone go off here, I would like to communicate how um, something as I've shared, the community engagement part of our work is the piece that's really, really important to me and really near and dear to my heart. I'm really excited about the work that we've been doing and excited to share that we're going to continue to be engaging our criminal justice partners in this process, different stakeholders in the community, treatment agencies. One of the things that we have coming up on September 21st that we'll be sharing out with you all later is we're gonna be hosting a um, round table discussion with some of our community partners to talk about the best practices for women working and working with those that are on probation. So I'm excited to hear what some of you all are gonna have to say in that space and really sharing that information back out with everyone as we learn more we're going to continue to grow and revamp policies as um, we learn more about what is going to work best with the clients that we're serving we have something else for kim from kimberly brown in the chat it says will this be available for treatment counselors to communicate regarding immediate treatment response jason can i get a little more context what would, would what be available for immediate treatment response? Let's see. We'll wait for a second to see if 
Kimberly adds a little bit more to that, to the context of that. Contacting counselors if their immediate counselor is out of the office. Oh, that's a great question. We need probably do a better job at that, frankly. You know, I will say one thing is, you know, probation counselors now since COVID have all been assigned laptops and cell phones. They they use those cell phones like they use them, you know, in their own life, where there's a lot of text communication with um, you know, with coworkers, with clients, you know, that it, we've found that it is a good way to stay connected. Uh, you know, those those opportunities are available to treatment providers as well. Um, but I think to your point, giving you a secondary contact as a treatment provider so that if you can't reach us, I mean, certainly we recognize that when we can't reach you, it's frustrating. I'm sure it's it goes both ways. We probably do a better job of giving you additional options on who you can connect to if you can't reach the counselor. Um, I don't have a great answer, you know, in terms of how to relieve that concern to you now, um, but I think it, it, it merits some attention for sure. Definitely, and I think, I mean, that's why we're having this conversation so we can get these types of questions and bring it back to our planning group and build in what is needed so that the clients are getting the best, most responsive <clears throat> support in their term with us and as their care is coming through with you all. I so see, we, one uh, more time. Oh, I see that John McGoodwin has had his hand up. So I'm gonna try allowing, allowing him to come off mute. Okay. Oh, I see his hand just went down, but okay. <laughs> let's see. John, if you wanted to say something, I think I think you can unmute. Just operator error, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, we encourage each of you to remain in contact with us whether it's giving information directly to us, the probation managers as part of the planning team, or just tracking what we have in the information that we're putting out virtually, you can sign up for the Probation Evolution newsletter. We also have blogs and we have our webpage all available through our SMC webpage. So we encourage you to continue to remain engaged with us in that way. If there are no more questions from our audience, each of us would just like to extend a thank you and a deep appreciation for excuse me, participating in our webinar today. And then just coming along for the ride with us as we share out what we're doing and how we are evolving as a department and better meeting the needs of the clients that we're serving. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, maybe we can hang on for a few more minutes if there are any last questions people have, but that, that's the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. We appreciate you.